Everything is personal right here Everything is personal right here Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another episode of Everything is Personal. All right, so with Everything is Personal, I have two of my personal really good friends and business partners on the show. We we usually don't do multiple guests, but this time it makes total sense. So I want to introduce Sadao Shiro and Andre Steiner, who are the co-founders of Quantic Hub. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Len. It's an honor to yeah. be here with you. Yeah, man, on Shabbat as well. It's a special so, date. That is true. So where where are both of you located right now? Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Now I'm located in Sao Paulo. Uh, I'm Sadal. I'm very glad to be here with you. I have listened to a couple of uh, podcasts you made before, and uh, it's it's awesome to be here. It, it's a pleasure and also honor to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation, Len. Thank you. I'm at Sao Paulo right now, back into Patagonia, but uh, <laughs> I want to talk about the that Patag- I want to talk about that Patagonia trip, man, because that that is uh, one of my places I really wanted to go and 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 hike, but I have to work myself up to it. Uh, and Andre, where are you uh, located? Uh, coincidence today, I'm in Sao Paulo as well. Uh, <laughs> you know, me and Sadal just uh, you know not long, not far away from one uh, one another. Yeah. We could have all done it in one. I was in Sao Paulo. We could have just done it all one place together. <laughs> true, true, man. Next time, you know? Yeah, uh, for sure. All right. So um, I'm going to start with Andre. Let's start with Andre. So I'm I'm interested in learning a lot about you guys personally, because I really believe that the spirit of a true entrepreneur starts in childhood. And as you go through your journey, uh, you, you know, those those uh, obstacles that you face on the way, uh, how you show up to be able to overcome those obstacles really make you either an entrepreneur or, you know, some people are comfortable working in their, you know, nine to five jobs or something like that. So first of all, Andre, where did you grow up? Then I grew up in Sao Paulo, actually, in Brazil. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my formation, my entire formation uh was here in sao paulo and uh, actually didn't travel a lot around the world when i was a, a child and young adult uh, much more you know to the south of brazil my family comes uh, my father comes from austria and my mother's family is from the south of brazil so where they they held uh, for uh, generations a farm down in the south a cattle farm so i used to go there a lot and I was a surfer, I guess, like Sadao as well. So we are we are generations apart, though. Yeah, when I was a surfer in Brazil, then I travel uh, around the, the beaches. And but it was in the time that uh, surfers were really badly viewed, you know, as you know the people that uh, you know the you know that we used to smoke cannabis and you know and that the, was the like, stoner the stoner hippies the stoner hippies <laughs> yes. We had no equipment, actually, as well, you know, like they have today. So uh, were you, were you, when you grew up in uh, the South, uh, did you grow up with your mother and your father? Were they together? Yes, they were together. My father was an entrepreneur, uh, and we lived in Sao Paulo. Uh, Got it. And then and then, uh, did you do you have any siblings? Do you have uh, sisters, brothers? Yes, I have two older sisters from the first uh, marriage of my father and one brother from the second marriage with my mother. So your parents ended up getting divorced at some point? No, my father got divorced from his first uh, marriage. Got my it. sister is older, like uh, 13 and, f- and 15 years older than me. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, met your mother and then stayed together. Uh, and then me and my brother, my brother is younger, like three year, three years younger than me. Yeah, he lives in Rio, where we have uh, the company headquarters. And I'm going there next week. So now he's going to Patagonia, and I'm going to Rio <laughs> to work. But <laughs> it's so uh, fine. All right, so let's let's switch to Sadao. So Sadao, where did you grow up? I grew up in Rio. Um, I I come from a working class family, actually immigrant family. Uh, my father was Japanese, was born in Okinawa, came to Brazil when he was at the age of eight years old. 
met my mother and moved back to Japan 30 years after. I was eight years old when he left. Uh, I was born in Santos. When my father left to, to back to Japan, we went to Rio. So I, I feel pretty much I, I was born in Rio because it's where the place I grew up. I love Rio. I'm Flamengo, as you know. And my mother, uh, the, the family of my mother also come from Italy. Both of them, uh, after the Second World War, they came to Brazil to start fresh. And uh, yeah, my life is uh, it is a it's a big mix. Uh, I moved to Japan when I was six, when I was sixteen to meet my father because when he left to Japan he never came back to Brazil. And I, did, I actually I went for a vacation and I decided to stay there for one year. Then I come back to Brazil. Uh, four years after when I was twenty I come back to Japan again. I, I left the college and went to Japan, and I come back as a DJ. And then it's when the mass uh, starts. So I was 10 years a professional DJ. I used to play in a lot of festivals. I was the neo hippies, you know. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, we practically started the electronic music scene in Brazil, me and my friends in Bahia. Uh, 10 years later, I was a piece set off of parties it's a lot of parties you know and living the night nightclubs and parties is you know it's it's not healthy <laughs> yeah. and i really want to be a father somehow so i come back from my what i study with logistics mm -hmm. i worked for the same company for 15 years and i start opening new companies and investing in, in new ventures and then i met andrea and we started quantic hub together but i also have some investments in the pub down the south of Brazil, uh, I have a, a, a wine store as well. And now it's uh, I also sponsor some MMA fighters. So we have some athletes, but I do believe in sports. I do believe in, in private companies helping uh, athletes because you know in Brazil there's a not, there's not a lot of investment from the government. So I do believe we can help out these guys, and uh, it's a in, in a short uh, way, it is, this is pretty much what I did in my life. And uh, yeah, here I am, representing our good company in Brazil. <laughs> well, let's, let me go back to uh, Charlie, because it's so interesting to me, um, and, and sort of both of you in a way, but I'll, I'll, since I'm talking to Sadal now, having this family dynamic where your father leaves and you have, you have siblings too, correct? You know, Sister, yeah. yeah, I have two sisters. Two sisters. So, when when you have the the persons, the patriarch of the family, leaving, like there's got to be an effect, right? It, like in, there's an effect as a kid growing up that my family dynamic has changed. Can you kind of walk me through how how that made you feel and y your journey to reconnect with your father and you know what what, what happened with that? It's uh, it's amazing, uh, Len, because I am uh, exactly uh, equal my father. You know the way we talk, the the way I behave. Even though we live separate, you know, and uh, I mean not half the world away, but the entire the entire world away. You yeah. know, uh, we are exactly the same. So then I start to believe in DNA. <laughs> I was gonna say that, right? It's a great segue, man, because it's, it's funny. Fuck. My when parents we're... were here visiting. <clears throat> my daughter just graduated from uh, high school, going to college. So my parents came and I was watching my dad and I'm like, holy shit, I cannot believe how much I am like my dad. And it even, even, the, even starting to look a little like my dad. And I, growing up, I never really looked like my dad, but now, I'm looking more like my dad. I'm sounding like my dad. Uh, the, the way the way I laugh is exactly the same way. Scary. My, 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 <laughs> it is scary. And you know, I am the Sancho of my family. Uh, Sancho is, uh, I, I'm there, you know, uh, of the sanctuary of the family. It goes to always to the, the elder uh, son. So you know, what does that mean? Does that mean you're the patriarch, you're the leader of the family? Is that is that what it means? I, uh, yeah, it's supposed to be. Okay. <laughs> and uh, no, yeah, but it's uh, it's uh, it's interesting because I, I I act like this 
even though in the modern world, we, we don't have to act like this. Yeah. So I own the sanctuary of the family. So my father was the elder uh, son, as my grandfather, and so it goes. Mm. And uh, it, 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 it's strange. I never felt uh, that I had to do this, but somehow I did. And when my father passed away, uh, my mother came. Uh, my grandmother came from Japan with the with the bones and the, and the rest of, of my father. And when she saw me, she started crying. I was not. I mean, I didn't met my my grandmother at that time for ten years, maybe. I was at the age of 24, 25 around. It was about twenty years ago, eighteen years ago. And she started crying. She did not manage to meet me because I look exactly like my father. Even the way I laugh, the way I walk, and uh, for her, meeting me, it was not good because, you know, uh, I think it, when a mother bury his son, her son is, is it's, you, you, you change the, the way it must be, right? So for her, it was really heavy to, to, to see me, you know. Yeah, it, it probably, she closed a, a chapter in her book. And then it, it sort of refreshed all that back again. So and uh, yeah, but you know, uh, when I when I decided to don't be a GG anymore, yeah. I have to start to scratch from the zero, you know, start from from nothing. And then I start building my, my career. And uh, uh, I met my wife uh, in the very beginning of the, 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 this, this chapter of my life. And this is how I, uh, I grew up business, uh, only, I mean, with my forts and my hard work, and I'm proud of it. Yeah, I mean, you should be proud of it because uh, it's it's not easy to do any sort of, It's <clears throat> people think that people who are in business for themselves kind of have a, an easy lifestyle. You know, you can make your own schedule, you know, this and that, but it's to me, it's much easier to be able to go to work work your day, come home, not think of it because you don't take that stress back with you. And, and the, I think the stress of being an entrepreneur, uh, you work way more. However, you get to make your decisions. You don't have to have you know your boss kind of telling you uh, what to do. It, it definitely makes a difference. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to Andre for a second, but before I do, I just wanted to ask what, from a culture standpoint. So I know the Brazil has a, a large Japanese uh, uh, culture there as well. First of all, did you know the language when you went to Japan? And how was the transition going from, you know, Rio to now living in Japan? Like, what, what was that culturally for you? Well, it is strange because in Rio, I was Japanese and in Japan, I was Brazilian, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, uh, actually, I was born in Santos. I moved to Rio really young. I went to Japan twice. I live in Porto Alegre, uh, nearby the, the the lands of Andrea. Uh, now I live in Sao Paulo for over maybe 20 years around it, 25 years. I'm always move, always on the move land. For me, it's... Uh, and I have plans to, to, to go out of Sao Paulo as well. Starting fresh again is always good, man. Uh, yeah. Makes me alive, you know. Uh, I agree. And as I said, yeah, entrepreneur life is is hard. I'm in the middle of vacations. You know? I, I was in Machu Picchu le last week. I'm going to Patagonia uh, next week. But I tell you, all, every other day I'm working. I have meetings. I have to meet Andrea. I have to meet other other partners. You never stop. Yeah. You never stop. Yeah, I know but my... uh, as far as culture is concerned, it's totally different. Japan is a, Japan is a different world, you know. Uh, good for some things, bad for others. But uh, in general, I live with, with the Italian side of the fa my family, so I didn't have the, the culture. I have to. I learned in Japan when, when I was sixteen, uh -huh. you know. So it's right. hard, but you know, you have to adapt yourself, you know. Yeah. And and I'm good on this. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. So Andre. Uh... When so you, at some point you left uh, Brazil and you went to Israel, is that was is that the case? And then I, I'm just trying to get your journey. So from Brazil, Israel, there's also Jamaica involved. Can you sort of walk through how that all like uh, culminated? Yeah, sure. I was just listening to Sadao and I, you know I'm thinking, 
wow, we have such a similar uh, way of life, me and him, you know, and probably with you as well, you know, uh, that is, you know, not a coincidence that we are together, you know, doing this, yeah. Uh, and, and like Sadao, you know, I moved, and like you, I moved a lot. Uh, but until I moved, I was in Brazil. Uh, I left my home at 17. I went to study in the army school here and became a, an officer. And my father thought that because I am, I think too much outside the box, probably it would be good that I had a career in the army. And yeah, but, to put you back in the box. <laughs> to put me back in the box, yes. But I was an officer outside the box. And, you know, after four years uh, uh, as an officer, I decided that it was not for me. And I decided to leave the army. And my father said, okay, you know, so I'm going to desert you. And actually, so I said, okay, fine, you know, desert me. I'm going to Israel. And I decided to, at 22, to go to Israel and learn Hebrew. And of course, uh, I had, uh, you know, a lot of uh, my, my, my growing up, you know, as a Jewish here in Brazil. I studied in an in a Italian school because my father was paramount to say that, you know, I am Brazilian, you know, because that's what saved him, actually. And my grandfather, you know, in Austria decided that he would be an Austrian. And, you know, and he was, you know, studying Belgium when the Second World War uh, exploded and they could actually live. So I was a Brazilian and, you know, I, I learned with Italians here uh, in, 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 in school. I was uh, one of the few Jewish, probably the three Jewish kids in the Italian school. But Andrea, sorry, uh, my, my son coincidentally studies in the same school that Andrea studied. <laughs> right, right. Such a it's small true. world, right? <laughs> and Sadao's uh, mother is Italian, you know, so you can see, you know, the, you know, the meshing and the, you know, how energy brought us together, you know, to do this. Yeah. But anyway, then I left and went to Israel uh, to study Hebrew and uh, I actually lived in Israel. Uh, I fell in love with the country back in the late 80s, you know, when the Berlin Wall fell and we felt like uh, confident that we were inheriting, you know, a different uh, kind of path. Yeah. And, and Israel was like uh, blooming with a socialistic society, very much uh, in tune, trying to, you know, get everybody the same uh, conditions. Uh, there were no poor people, uh, and, you know, in a kibbutz, actually the work was the most important thing. It was not money, and so I, you know, I I had my my early uh, adult life thought about you know work as ethic and you know and loving what you do, you know, and then everything would uh, happen. You know, money was a consequence of you you know giving, you know, to that uh, society. So I fell in love, and I said my father is not coming back to Brazil and actually got his blessings and i i married and stayed uh, in israel uh, for over a decade of course in the in the between uh, i served the army uh, a little bit as well in israel and then after that uh, me and my uh, you know at the time my girlfriend we went uh, to travel around the world as a good israelis backpack you know through india and the far east and then the united states and South America, and then back to Israel, back to the kibbutz, uh, back to work, uh, work in the fish ponds, which had like a, a nice uh, ornamental farm, working with koi, which I fell in love. And, you know, I was already in love with Japan. And then there's another connection with Sadao there. And, you know, the samurai, uh, uh, you know, way of life. And the whole thing about the koi becoming a dragon and, you know, with, you know, our evolution you know, on it. So, you know, uh, I studied philosophy and, you know, and work with the Koi and the Koi actually, um, after, you know, I studied in the Hebrew University, you know, uh, first in the path of uh, veterinary, but we needed to study zoology and biology, you know, in that path as well. And then, you know, after that, I was uh, invited to come to Jamaica to set, you know, koi farms in Jamaica to service the U.S. market, which was very far away from Israel. And so I took that challenge. Of course, you know, Bob Marley and Jamaica were very alluring to me. And then, you know, I decided to take, it was a three-year 
uh, contract. And I was supposed to come back to the kibbutz, which I loved. But, you know, after being in Jamaica for one and a half year, I was invited to become a partner in, you know, in the fish farms. And then, you know, Israel started to become far away from me. And I spent the last, the next 20 years in Jamaica. Actually, after that, I became the, you know, the fish farms uh, flourished, but didn't really happen, you know, the way I thought it would happen. And then, you know, uh, in the middle of the way, I became the the exclusive distributor of uh, Havaianas rubber sandals for Jamaica. And then I got uh, many Caribbean uh, territories and, you know, built like, uh, you know, many companies in different, uh, in different uh, island uh, nations. And I did that for 15 years. Uh, you know, we kind of invented the Havaianas store. And so, you know, it was really fun and 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 challenging at the same time and you know cannabis came in the middle of all of that because of the rastafari uh, culture the high rastafari that i met in jamaica that had a philosophy you know that took them back to the years of uh, the king solomon and the queen of sheba and they told me that story and they told me about, uh, you know, how important it is to preserve the land and, you know, to do it idle, you know, like really to, to the idle way is actually the way of, you know, the ancient uh, Hebrews, you know, the way that we did it in the desert, uh, you know, how we preserve our culture and it's even, you know, sitting in a table uh, or having a conversation between friends you know, and so the whole thing, you know, uh, brought me to the cannabis in that direction. And then, you know, uh, my children used to come to spend the holidays with me in, in Jamaica, like three, four months. And I knew that they would smoke one day. So, you know, I asked the, the master Rastafari, you know, how I would present uh, cannabis to the kids. And then, you know, then they you know it, they pour them out yeah everything and i fell in love with uh, what we're doing today yeah yeah i want to get into that in a second just uh, the question is how did you guys meet and then so, so that was like sort of uh journey uh with cat because it, it seems to me like First of all, you guys have a lot of commonalities and we have a lot of commonalities, but also there's a common thread of cannabis uh, as well. So, so that was journey with, with cannabis and also how, how you guys actually met. Well, it's a fun story. <laughs> we'll have a friend in common. Uh, he has some, 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 some issues and uh, he was treating himself with cannabis. And one time he really was... I mean, out of his mind. And as on Facebook, a friend of ours uh, make a funding from friends to, to help the guy. I was in a good, in a good, you know, I was not bad in the in the in the pandemics. Actually, the pandemics for my logistics business was really good. Uh, as far as money is concerned, I'm not telling that pandemic was good, okay? But you know, for the business, it was a, a big opportunity. And I, I give them him some money, and uh, and he was also Andre was uh, mentoring him, uh, something like this, right, Andre? Yeah, I was uh, uh, mentoring him on the yeah business he wanted to build. Yeah, and uh, the guy invited me to you know to invest in a company that he was about to open a clinic, and he make a presentation for me. Say, hey, I have no interest in investing in this company, but if I was you, I, I give him some advices. Andrea was in this meeting as well, and then he come back and say, hey, okay, so now we don't have to invest. Take a little share of the company and let's make it together. So okay, this way is better if I don't have to put any money. <laughs> and then we, we we start. Of course, I had to put some money. <laughs> And uh, then I met Andrea. Uh, we started to get along, and, 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 and at some point we realized that that business model was not good. Uh, and then we decided to open the Quentin Hub. Uh, you know, bring some product innovation and have some some verticals with a different uh, verticals of cannabis business in Brazil. 
actually opening a, a cannabis company in Brazil right now, it's for, for crazy ones, rebels, you know, uh, it's not for a, for a common guy. And here we are. I don't know, Andre, if you have something to add, but basically it's but, something, uh, it was something like this, right? It was something like that from your point of view, yes. Uh, it, for me, it was also energy. And, you know, there's no coincidence in the world, but uh, I, uh, I was in Jamaica, you know, uh, building uh, a company um, that, uh, you know, of course, Endo was already part of my plan. Uh, as I, you know, knew that, uh, you know, uh, genetics should be, you know, involved in, in personalized medicine and precision medicine should be involved in this business. I was not thinking to come back to Brazil, actually, you know, uh, although I had uh, a farm here that I was taking care of and, you know, and everything. My life was in the Caribbean and I love the Caribbean. I love uh, Jamaica. You know, uh, so I was there building the business and then the pandemic uh, hit and us and nobody thought that, you know, it would happen the way it happened. I thought it nobody can close the world for more than one day. Yeah. But then they closed the world and five million tourists became zero tourists. And, you know, the business was, you know, focused on that. So, you know, it was kind of, um, you know, the monster were passing. And then, you know, uh, I met this friend, uh, common friend of our, ours through, uh, you know, through, through friends as well. And they asked me to, if I could mentor him because he was, uh, you know, he was in a, you know, in a very good uh, mental, uh, mo uh, mental health at that moment. So, you know, I decided to mentor the guy and, you know, actually take him out of the idea of, uh, you know, you know, doing something stupid. Yeah. And in the meantime, you know, the whole thing in Jamaica, uh, you know, came to a halt because I had uh, cultivation, you know, uh, of cannabis. And of course, uh, we were doing uh, phytocomplexes uh, in Kingston. Um, and I decided to come back to Brazil. By the end of 2020, I was back here. I went down to my farm and I actually decided to, you know, open up a business that, uh, a business model that I have with water. We have like a crazy good water down there. And, you know, uh, and I, Quantic Medicine was, you know, a background of mine as well, uh, you know, years and years ago. So it was really a company for Quantic Water. And, you know, one day I talk about that. And then, you know, I met Sadao uh, through these meetings and, you know, we, we decided to, you know, move forward. And, uh, and Sadao had a very good idea. He said, uh, let's study, you know, before we, you know, run. Yeah. And then he kind of built a, a group of people that would uh, make this very, you know, detailed study of the business. And I actually met him uh, in real life, uh, I think two or three months later. We are already doing the study. And then through that, you know, in a couple of months, we decided that we would go a different direction and we would build the country hub. And then, you know, we are here today. And it was a match. I mean, Min Sadao, uh, you know, uh, we, you know, it's the energy, you know, everything you know, everything moved forward uh, and, uh, and I'm very grateful for, you know, this uh, meeting him as I'm grateful of meeting you. Yeah, it took myself uh, personally to another level of, uh, you know, consciousness and, you know, and Why? here we are. I appreciate so, it. Sorry for bringing you back to Brazil, Nur. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, thank you so much. <laughs> No, I'm I, I'm super grateful for meeting both of you too because uh, you know business aside, I, I'm a big believer in uh, in people. You know, like business is business, but you can do a lot of things when you have the right people around you. And I, I mean, Andre is right. I believe in energy as well, and things happen for reasons. And maybe it's not even today. Maybe it's you know in years, but what you put out into the universe comes back to you tenfold if you don't have those expectations in place. And, and the, you know, through this industry, I met some most incredible people and you guys are uh, up there as well. And I am super grateful for the experience that 
both of you uh, supported me through when I just visited uh, Brazil not so long ago uh, in Rio and Sao Paulo. So thank you for that uh, also. And I, I really think that that based on that foundational energy, there's a, a lot of things that we can all do together. L let me back up and, and what, so what is the Quantic Hub? Like what, if you were to describe it to our audience, what is it? What's the mission? What's the vision? And what are you guys' plans from a business perspective? Either well, one can start. That, there's a lot of things, Bandura, you can start and <laughs> I, I make the compliments. Just one thing, Len, just compliment what you said. Yeah. I always say to Andrea that our business is about people. And if you don't know about people, you don't know about the business. And that's it, right? Andrea, yeah. maybe, maybe you can explain a little bit about what we are doing right now. <laughs> Well, yeah, no, I agree with Sadal completely. You know, it's about people. We uh, we decide our mission is to change uh, everything here in Brazil. We believe that uh, we are, you know, in the forefront of a great revolution in natural uh, way of uh, seeing things again and doing things. And so the Quantic Hub came to launch precision medicine in Brazil. Uh, of course, with the you know backing of uh, the endo kind of health, endo DNA, uh, and you know everything that we are doing together, and our mission here is to lead the industry to the right uh, path. We believe that uh, we can. We believe that we have a vision of Brazil uh, that can become something important uh, in the world uh, arena. Uh, in the next stage of uh, our evolution here as uh, as hu uh, humans, uh, and um, and so we we thought that we would bring uh, something different, you know, uh, to Brazil. We would uh, do innovation. We would uh, bring a new way of uh, looking at uh, cannabis and cannabinoids, uh, and we would uh, lead, you know, lead with uh, with the people. You know, uh, lead the way with the uh, ethics, lead the way with, uh, you know, with, uh, with the heart as well, you know, but be good business people as well at the same time, you know, and, and uh, I think, um, you know, Sadao has many yeah. things to add to that. <laughs> we, no, we do believe we're really nearby a perfect storm. We're still not in the perfect storm. Brazil is an agriculture powerhouse. Mm -hmm. We still haven't have not set up the regulations like the U.S., Canada, Uruguay, and other places. So we have to change the chance of learning with uh, other countries' mistakes, you know, and do and, and make a, a, a different way, a different perspective of cannabis, not only as, as medicinal cannabis, but also uh, the industrial, the textiles, and everything. So somehow we are trying to lead, trying to, to go also to the governors, to, to, to the government to, to, to show them the right way of doing this, you know. So this is pretty much our mission, you know. So right now, like this is a two-part question. What is the current status of what you can do regarding the cannabis and just precision medicine and phytocomplexes and all? What's permitted in Brazil today? And what are we trying to do? Because you mentioned the U.S. The U.S. doesn't really, the way the U.S. is set up, I'm not sure if it's the right way. Every state makes their own decisions. Uh, federally, cannabis is still a Schedule One, the same thing as uh, you know opioids and, and other uh, drugs, which makes no sense whatsoever. And then there's a hemp bill that allows you to distribute hemp between the states as long as it's 0.3% THC or less, but still it's not CBD, it's hemp. Just a lot of nuances in that, which I don't think really makes sense and super confusing. So once again, what's currently in place in Brazil today? What can you do? And then what are you trying to change and where do you want it to go? Well, Brazil, uh, if you will allow me to so though. Brazil, well, well. Uh, Brazil, it's, uh, you know, we are not allowed to cultivate in Brazil. We have no actually, you know, uh, regulation in place as cannabis. Uh, we have two 
um, you know, uh, regulations come from uh, actually the regulator and visa, you know, and not from the government saying that we can import uh, cannabis because health is enshrined in our constitution. So if uh, a doctor tells, you know, the system that, you know, that patient needs to be treated with cannabis, then the, the government must allow, you know, cannabis in. So we have two routes. One is like importing products from outside, uh, uh, you know, uh, manufactured products already from outside Brazil directly to the patient. You know, so our company deals with that. Yeah. And you have another path that you can bring, uh, uh, you know, biomass of cannabis or, you know, actually, you know, CBD and THC like, uh, you know, in uh, in oil uh, or other uh, format to build uh, products here in Brazil, you know, but uh, you cannot uh, cultivate or you cannot uh, have a lab or you cannot extract, you cannot do nothing in, in Brazil. So we decided that we should push to have regulation, but in a proper way, because, you know, there are some associations and, you know, that they, you know, this is the third way. <laughs> yeah, they broke the law. Yeah. And they actually got a foothold on cultivation and extraction and, you know, but they have no real, um, you know, there's nobody really looking at how they are cultivating or extracting or, you know. There's no uh, standards that are in place. There's no standards, follow, exactly. Right? There's no standards to follow. So what we are proposing, actually, with uh, we are working in uh, the federal, together with the federal government, actually with the Senate, through uh, a um, third party called Invest Brazil uh, Group, which is actually a... Uh, uh, twofold, uh, it's a uh, is an institute and is actually a, a part of the Senate in Brazil to uh, put a, a to actually set uh, the first uh, labs in Brazil, the the lab of testing biomass, which we believe this is the first thing that we should have. We should be able to test the biomass, then have biomass to test. We are actually going to put uh, this lab to work in a showroom for cultivation of cannabis and also of hemp. And then we're gonna show, you know, the that science can lead the way of regulation. And then we would propose regulation. We are actually looking at the, the problematic in California of uh, licensing and having too many licenses. And so we will propose to the, to the Senate a way that we can be, that we believe that this can be regulated. And then we will have a lab for extraction and a lab for phytocomplex uh, 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 production. And then I think regulation will follow. This would be the first lab in Latin America to be in service of the legislators. Yeah, we, and we are taking this uh, uh, example from Israel again, which, uh, you know, has that in place, which enable Israel to become the, you know, the path of uh, innovation that it has taken in the last 20 years. Yeah? So we believe that uh, this is the way to go. And that's what we're doing. We're pushing for it. Yeah, yeah no, I, I completely agree with you. I, you know, to caution one thing, it's uh, Israel. The, one of the reasons why Israel uh, has so much innovation and so much uh, support in in the cannabis space is because they focus completely on a medical program. So you have doctors that are prescribing. You have people that are giving back feedback on efficacy. And I think a lot of these countries, including the Canada, is probably the biggest culprit of this. That said, you know what? We're looking at this as a completely different business. We're looking at it as a business, just like tobacco and alcohol, which we're going to tax the shit out of it. And we're going to we're going to regulate, but we're going to only regulate certain things. And I think that's a huge error on their part, because as you said, standards. Well, there is no what are the standards? What is being tested? You're testing for pesticides, but you're not testing for efficacy. Also, labs. What is the standard of a lab? In the United States right now, I can send out my sample to three different labs and get three different results. And the reason why, you said, Andre, the, the reason why is because the federal government doesn't have a mandate on what standards they have to have for the lab. 
the first thing you need to do is the same way that you do with any nutrient, any supplement, any vitamin, when you get it in a store, it doesn't matter where, what place you get it, you can read the label, you think that it's legitimate because it came through a third party, it's stamped, CGMP, all that other stuff. In cannabis, you don't have that. It's a guessing game from place to place. So having that standard, I think, in place is uh, is key and having the government support that and looking at as, you know, I don't like the word recreational according to uh, associated with cannabis. I look at it as an adult use. If you're an adult, you have the right to do whatever you want to do. However, there is a place for medicine and, and precision medicine, precision therapeutics need to be treated differently than it is my over-the-counter, you know, vitamin C. Uh, so I, I'm just saying that when these programs are being initiated and put in place, you have to have a consideration that people are using it. And one of the most amazing things that I got to experience when I was in, in Brazil is that patient feedback where I'm speaking to you know, through through you guys and you know through people with it within uh, Quantic on you know these people that you know had an autistic child or or had you know this condition or even psoriasis in their hands or or uh, you know uh, you have another investor that his daughter wasn't doing well in school and he was telling me the the story about now she's you know getting great great like. That is what it's all about. And, and we tend to forget sometimes because we're consumers of cannabis and we'll get into the fun stuff in the conversation, but we get to, we forget sometimes because, you know, we're busy running a business, but we are providing medicine for people that truly need this in order to do better in their lives. And if we start, start, uh, start forgetting about that, I think we run into the trap of what a lot of these countries do. And it's not alcohol and it's not tobacco. It's a, it's own unique, unique product and needs to be treated with that kind of respect. So that, that's my really yeah, the, our, our very first patient, uh, Mr. Geraldo, remember this, Andre? I think he's yeah, to with us. Yes. He has about 20 epileptic attacks a day. True. Now he has zero. You know, Phenomenal. It's, it's, uh, it's with the fighter problem, uh, formulations. Yes. Yeah. It's an, it's an amazing and, thing. And some, 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 sometimes he texts me, "Hey, you you guys are blessed. You 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 are bringing a message from God because he's very religious, very Catholic. Yeah. You're bringing a message from God. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for this and blah blah blah. It's uh, I mean, well, and for for me, like he kind of like I say, the, the the daughter of Beto, one of our investors. Yeah. 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 You know, the, the story is also amazing, you know, and we have a, a plenty uh, of stories like this, you know, I, I mean, I, I mean, uh, it's, it's hard to say, but somehow it saved my, 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 my marriage with my wife because we were mo almost divorcing. Uh, we, you know, were very stressed, very uh, with anxiety and I knows better. And uh, when we start treating ourselves, of course, a lot of conversation, you know, uh, psychiatry as well. Now we're in a very good mood, you know. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing uh, thing. And I, I'm so glad you, you're sharing this. Uh, it's, it's difficult to have personal discussions, but we, we tend to forget. That's why I want to bring it up to the surface, because you guys mission. It's not only do we want to uh, regulate cannabis, we want to cultivate. We are providing together all of us we're providing real medicine to people that need it and to do it right at scale and to have those standards so people feel comfortable when they get their medicine it's always the same like anything else and you know we're, we're changing people's lives and starting with brazil but i think yeah. we can do this uh, we're coming to you know to visit you soon you know to you know <laughs> gather all this information to with you you know to we bring it over here yeah yeah, we also have another in-house example. Uh, the the son-in-law of Gustavo, or COO, uh, he's uh, he not even not even able to talk. You know, he has autism. Yeah, autism. And uh, a couple of months ago, uh, his former wife uh, dropped me a message. Hey, Sadao, you're the only one who can tell me: is this guy speaking Japanese? The guy was speaking in Japanese, you know. He was not even able to speak in, in to talk in Portuguese. Mm. 
you know, it's 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 a it's a sort of miracle, you know. <laughs> so you know, he's he's speaking Japanese, he's Japanese, you know. And, uh, I mean, it's it's it's, it's, um, it's totally unbelievable, you know. It's totally unbelievable. I we truly that. believe, you know, that uh, you know, if people can, you know, if we can help, you know, to in this, you know, to balance people back, you know, and and people feel healthy again. You know, uh, even that we are surrounded by all these toxins and, and you know, in our modern life, mm -hmm. then we can have a conversation, you know, then we can change everything, you know, and we can sit together with each other again and gather together and think about, you know, a new way of uh, dealing with this world. Because, you know, I mean, I'm 57 now, you know, I'm thinking about my children and, you know, one day, uh, you know, my grandchildren you know, uh, and and you guys too. I mean, you guys are younger than me, but, you know, we have been, you know, through uh, almost, you know, I'm through <laughs> half of my life plus and I was still younger, you know, than me, but uh, we have children and we need to think about the next generations in, in, and we are the ones that must lead this change, you know, it's on our plate now, you know. Yeah. Another, class, another, another classical conversation I had with Andre in my house because we open everything in, in this in the place I'm right now in my my my, my home office and uh, at some point uh, I said to Andre, hey Andre, we're not open opening this company for us. We're opening this comp company for the next generations, you know, for the, the generations to come, not for yeah. us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, so, I that we, so that has supported me as well, you know, through the, you know, I'm building this uh, in the South, uh, this, uh, that's supposed to be a center for excellence between Israel and, and Brazil. Uh, and, you know, he's been supporting this because this, in, you know, the end result, it's a, a, a pledge for peace, you know, yeah. between peoples. Yeah. And, you know, we believe that this can happen, you know, maybe we're naive, still naive after all these years, but, uh, you know, here, but we believe that we can do better. Yeah. You know? Okay. Many investors who do extraordinary things have to be naive in order to do that. Because uh, if you're, if you just believe what's possible, you don't see be, be beyond that to what may be impossible today, but it's not going to be impossible tomorrow uh, with the advent of, you know, machine learning, AI, all that stuff, accelerated growth everywhere. All right, let, let's have some fun uh, because yes. you guys are fun uh, and we've we've talked and we can talk about Quantic and uh, all the stuff that you're doing. Uh, I want to ask, uh, let's go uh, Andre first. Please describe your first experience with cannabis. Well, my first experience was in a, in a beach in Brazil. Uh, I, I think I was 14. We we're surfing at the end of the day. You know, all the surfers and the people from that beach would gather together uh, a, a, a bonfire, you know, like a, a real luau, you know, Hawaiian luau. And we sat together and, you know, suddenly I smelled that, uh, you know, uh, sweet you know, thing coming and, you know, and they were passing, you know, like many joints at the same time. You know, I think I got like three in my hand, <laughs> you know, and you can imagine how it was that night. Yeah. And, you know, that opened up, you know, a whole new universe. And but was it a good experience? Like when you, when you consume cannabis, was, did you have a good it experience? It was a great experience. It was a great experience for me in the first experience. And, you know, it was amazing. And, you know, and um, that's why I'm still, you know, doing it today, you know, in many different ways, yeah, it 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 opened up, you know, doors, you know, doorways, yeah. Uh, so now, <laughs> mine was not that romantic. <laughs> I didn't talk about the women, huh? <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I, I was, you know, I was this in Rio, living in the suburb. Uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, favelas and. Uh, I used to be a soccer player and I used to play with Gustavo. Gustavo again, he is my friend since I was 13 years old because of this. And we used to play together all the time. And Gustavo started to smoke and say, I, I wanted to, to taste this, you know. And he used to live nearby a cliff and you, you go up in the cliff and smoke a joint. Went down and played soccer together. I never played so well. I scored a lot of goals. I was center forward <laughs> and he was midfield. <laughs> Um, but I love it, and uh, we're near. Well, we're now, near. now it makes sense why uh, you know Jimmy was telling me that 
uh, WADA sees cannabis as a as a, a an enhancing a substance performance enhancement because uh, you you know probably from you because you smoked and scored all those goals so they see this as a that's why I believe in sports <laughs> and he, I I don't know if you know but Quantic is uh, is sponsor uh, uh, an American event called mm -hmm. LFA the very mm -hmm. big the, the the second second or the third biggest event of MMA in the world. And the the athletes we we sponsor they they feedback to us a lot of improvements. Yeah, it's you know, uh, we, we with the treatments, you know, when the we have now two guys that are going to to the Dana White Container Series. They probably go to UFC next year. So you're gonna see your name in the US really soon, brother. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Perfect. All right, all right, all right. So let's let's talk about music, which is my other I love it passion. Well, I I have to on record say i am so grateful sadal that you went into your personal record collection and you know i'm a big music guy and hand selected me some of those amazing music that i'd never heard before and i just been listening over and over to the, some of these records just incredible the funk that comes out of man just awesome so super super grateful thank you for that um welcome brother all right so i'm going to put you on the spot for the next year you have to listen to five albums. Okay. Now, it doesn't have to be the name of the album. It can be just who the artist is. But what would be those five albums that you would listen to for next year? Uh, but you mean my fives? Uh, what you you can select? Uh, you know, five albums, five artists, or whatever that you will listen to just those five for the next year. And you don't okay. have to remember the name of the record, who who they be. So, and I know while you're thinking, so, sometimes this list changes. Like if somebody asks me today, oh, I'm in the mood for these five. Uh, no, and come tomorrow. on, it, it is a, the easy task for me. <laughs> one of them I gave to you is, uh, I have to buy another one. It's a Cabo Chorari from Novos Baianos. It's, it's a beautiful album. Okay. Uh, it was elected by the Rolling Stones uh, magazine as the, the best album ever recorded in Brazil. Uh, Middle from Pink Floyd, 1971. I, I love this, this, this album. Uh, Funkadelic, move your, move your, uh, Free Your Mind and Your As You Follow. I love this one. Frank Zappa, We Are On It For The Money. Uh, this is a beautiful one. And also... Uh, the Ramones Roca Trucia. <laughs> it's a big mix. Sorry. Oh, can oh, I do another great. another one? All right. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, relaxing with Miles Davis is the last one from the Precious Records era. It's a beautiful one. masterpiece. Love it. Yeah. All right, Andre. Well, we're not so great on music like you guys, but. Uh... Damien Marley, welcome to, to Jam Rock. You know, I think it's, uh, you know, one of the greatest uh, after Bob. Um, the final cut from uh, Pink Floyd. I love, love this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, um, wow. Uh, uh, it doesn't have to be the name of the album. You can just say like an a... Whatever. Uh, okay. So. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I love Brazilian music. So, you know, I love Bossa Nova a lot. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, of course, the old guard of the Brazilian music, like uh, Caetano and Gil and Javan and Maria Bethania, Gal Costa. Um, and uh, and also, you know, I, I grew up, I was a teenager in the, in the 80s. So there is some great uh, Brazilian bands. In the 80s as well, you know, that uh, Legion Urbana. Uh, and um, I think uh, it comes on top of my mind. Um, well, one more, one more. Um, well, I would say uh, Simon and Garfunkel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know i was i was waiting for that for you i was like he's going he's going old school like mellow james taylor uh, simon and garfunkel i know you were going there i thought maybe you'd uh throw in some duran duran uh, as well because i heard I you listening to a lot of that yes. yeah man love all, all of that you know all the 80s and uh yeah music for sure can i, I add jetro tal wakwa lang true true jetro tal 
All right, since since uh, you're talking, uh, uh, another music question. Do you remember what the first concert you ever attended was? I do remember. Well, um, uh, let's. Uh, oh, sorry, Andre, Andre, Andre. I'll ask Andre uh, yeah. first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what was the first concert? <laughs> it was had? Queen in 1980. You know, here in São Paulo in the Morumbi Stadium. Wow. That was the first one that, uh, I I I went. All right, so so now. Uh, me was a remarkable one. Uh-huh. It was the uh, Hollywood Rock. Uh, it was a festival, a side festival of Rock in Rio. Uh, one year before, it was Alice in Chains, Nirvana, in the same show. I was not there because I was too young. Although I, I, I read, loved the, 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 the you know, Seattle bands. Your bar. And, and the next year came for the very first time in Brazil, in Moroccan Stadium. The Rolling Stones, 1994, I guess. Wow. And the opener, uh, the, the 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 woman that opened up the show just passed away a couple of months ago, Rita Lee. And she was invited by Rolling Stones to to go over the 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 tour with them after that show. So it's a uh, and I was smoking cannabis at that time. I was only 14 years old. <laughs> yeah, that's sad. Uh... Yeah, it was like my. I was fourteen. I went to Pink Floyd with my dad. Oh, brother. no, come on! Yeah, and then the, the my favorite band. Time. Somebody passed a joint to us. I was there with three of my friends, so it was my first time at a concert actually sneaking in a hit. A was joint. your first joint as well? No. no, 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 no. It was my first joint at a con- concert. I was I was younger when I started. <laughs> Yeah, Pink Floyd is my favorite band, as you know, and uh, I'm not a huge fan of Rolling Stones, although I love it. Yeah, but it's not on my top ten list. But uh, that that concert was okay. Amazing. So let's 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 ask you guys. It's not on my list of questions. I'm just curious. What was the best concert that you ever saw? Oh, Andrew first. <laughs> wow, I think it was. Uh, you know, there's a band called Titans here in in Brazil, and they were just launching uh, themselves uh, here in in uh, São Paulo in a uh, in a very obscure <laughs> place, but the the show was like uh, packed with the uh, you know the people that were in the the knowing yeah, uh, it was so so a mixture of uh, you know these uh, these people and these guys did uh, you know an amazing show and they became like uh, after that they exploded in Brazil but it was so this was uh, for me uh, that it's a very nice band it's a very yeah. nice band. And and the mixture of the band in the the first show, like uh, for a lot of people, and it was like uh, kind of uh, just word of mouth, you know. Um, yeah. That was that, that was it for me. That was the most uh, amazing show I ever watched. What about you, Sudal? Oh, you know, I'm a huge fan of Pink Floyd. It's my favorite band. I went to just maybe three three or four times on a Roger Waters show. But then David Gilmour came to came to Brazil, and they took a very strong LSD and went to the to David Gilmour's <laughs> concert, and it, it was when I got more emotional. You know, he started the, the concert with uh, a, a solo career song, and the second one he went to China and Crazy Diamond. The second chord I was bending on my knees, crying and. Hey, thanks God. <laughs> yeah, for me, it is is the voice and the guitar of Pink Floyd, and I got so emotional because I was I was waiting this for so long. Yeah, so long. It, and for me, that 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 moment was something yeah, remarkable he, in my he's life. He's incredible. I, I I think people underestimate. Like I know Pink Floyd is not Pink Floyd anymore because you know they have some deaths and whatever Roger Waters, but when David Gilmore plays solo. It, there's such an emotional connection because his guitar is like a voice that sings and cries, like it almost cries with a guitar. Uh, and and I saw a documentary where his wife was saying that he does, he's not a really good communicator. He's very quiet. He's very reserved. He's shy. Very shy. But he speaks through the, the guitar and all the emotion that he has pent up that he doesn't know how to communicate 
he speaks through his music. So yeah, I concur. Amazing. And I have a second one that was beautiful as well. Uh, sorry. Uh, I was invited from my mother-in-law to go to a concert in Rio. I said, hey, I have some tickets in Rio for a, a famous guy. You want to go with us? Okay. And I, you know, in that time he was working for the federal government and he used to, to, you know, to get a lot of free tickets to go to concerts and big events in Brazil. And I was going to two main events that I said, okay, I'll not even ask. And one day before, I learned that it was Eric Clapton. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and we are in a very VIP place uh, with champagne, food, blah, blah, blah. And then when he starts playing, and when he play Before You Accuse Me, I start crying again. I don't know. I, I never cry. When my father passed away, I didn't cry. It. But sometimes when I listen to some music, I start crying, you know. And when he starts solo uh, with the guitar playing Before You Accuse Me, I remember my times in Japan because when he launched and Unplug It, I was living in Japan in 1996, 1995, around it. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember I bought this CD and this music maybe, I mean, left a, like a tattoo in my heart, you know. <laughs> you, you know, it's, it's interesting you say that because <clears throat> I always tell people that I love sad music. Sad music, I, happy music is great. I can listen to, I can dance, I can have fun. But when I'm by myself, I love sad. Like, like Alice in Chains is so sad. If you listen to lyrics, I love so it. Much have all the records. <laughs> yeah, so, so much sadness, but it connects with me. So, also, some music makes you cry. I'm not a big crier either, but that the sadness, I think maybe because we suppress a lot of that emotion and we, let go and just connect to the music you know whatever we suppress kind of flows out of us maybe that's why yeah, yeah that i also have this with chris cornell <laughs> oh super sad yeah. yeah you know nirvana and sad. all right yeah. <clears throat> um so andre i'll ask i'll ask you uh what has cannabis meant in your life well Cannabis, I think uh, it was, you know, it started on that experience of uh, the surfing, you know, which for me, it was freedom, freedom and nature together as a whole new way of uh, seeing things and living, you know, and uh, it punctuated all my life because, you know, I lived in nature and I was free, you know, I basically decided I would uh, do what my heart tells me to do and not going to follow the path, you know, the, you know, the, the beaten path, you know, I'm going to take it, you know, I'm going to go into the dark forest and, you know, find my own path. And that's cannabis for me. It's my mother nature, you know, telling, you know, talking directly to us. Yeah. So now. Well, for me, cannabis can change the world in a better world. You know, I, I mean, and it's uh, has so it's so meaningful to me, and it's not a, about the, the adult use, uh, medicinal use, uh, industrial use. It can be used in a lot of things, and, and I do believe cannabis can save the world. Come on, love that. Bob Marley. Agreed. Yeah, for sure. One love. All right. Uh, bonus question. I'll start with Sadal, and I know that you've lived in different homes and all that. So you can choose whatever you want. So it's, uh, please describe what your room looked like growing up. Uh, sorry, again, ask again. What, what your room, the room that you lived in, what did it look like when you were growing up? Like, uh, I'll give you an oh. example. I'll give you an example. Like my room, I had a certain bed. I had posters. I had like a Van Halen poster with Dave Lee Roth doing the splits in the air. I had Bruce Lee posters everywhere. So like that kind of description. Okay. Uh, it was, of course, a sound system. No television. <laughs> uh, I have three posters. Ramon's Local Life, Black Album from Metallica. And another one is uh, was a psychedelic drawing, you know. And uh, I always be like, you know. A music guy, as you know it. That's why I was DJ for so many years. Although I played electronic music, my background was always rock and roll, blues, jazz, you know, Brazilian music. Mm -hmm. But very like a surfer guy uh, yeah. with uh, a music, a rock and roll rock star. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I want I wanted to ask you uh, before I get to Andre. Same same question. As as a DJ, 
uh, you know, doing uh, electronic music before like EDM was as huge as it is now with festivals. Have you ever thought about like being a producer and producing, you know, tracks and producing tracks for other people? Have you ever thought uh, about that? I, I have produced two tracks. Okay. But in that time, I know I, I, I told you that I came from a working class family. I was really young. I was, when I started playing, I was at the age of 19, 20 years. I didn't have money enough to, to, to buy all the, the, the equipments I, I had to buy to, 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 to be a producer. And it's a pity because I think I've, I, I, you know, I, I love to study. I love music. So I could be a good producer, but I didn't have invest the necessary investments to, to, to make it happen. Wow. I would try to find my, the, the two tracks I produced when I was younger and then share with you. Share them for it, sure. It, it's not that good, but you know, it was uh, uh, in the, the end of 90s. You know, so, yeah, but it, it was uh, pretty much a good, you know, deep house music. Love it, man. I love the Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Cool. All right, Andre, uh, please describe what your room looked like growing up. Okay, man. My room had like uh, the same like you guys had, like, like a sound system over there, but I was a kind of a nerd. So I had like, uh, my father had set for me like a library. So I had uh, all these books that, uh, you know, I used to love to go through as well. And of course, I had a poster of Bruce Lee. And I had a poster of uh, people, you know, Brazilian surfing in Bali, you know, at that time, you know, uh, and, you know, my bed. And uh, that was it, you know. Cool. Well, guys, uh, is there anything else that you want to talk about in terms of uh, Quantic Hub, like where you're going? How can people co uh, contact you? What, uh, or if people are interested in, in, in engaging uh, where can they find out more information? They contact you, Len. <laughs> <laughs> you contact I'll send them right to you. <laughs> oh, but... You are a connoisseur. <laughs> yeah, man. Thank you. Our ambassador thank in you. the US. The concierge. And I, uh, I would like to thank you for, for this time, for the moment. It was so lovely. So I had, you know, loads of fun with you guys. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that our crosses have you know, our, our paths have crossed it somehow. And uh, yeah, looking forward to do more. Yeah, no, likewise. Have a great trip, uh, Sadao, uh, to Patagonia, yeah, with your kids, yeah, and... Yeah, yeah, I, I you know, I'm really recovered, you know, I, I recharged it. I yeah. just came from uh, 10 days in, in Peru. I went to Machu Picchu, the Nazca Lines, Cusco, and I tell you, lady, you, you have to... Amazing. To come down to South America again. Yeah, we're going to do the, the, the Inca Trail, yeah, soon, together. It, yeah. We can do the Inca Trail together. It, it's hard because, the, you know, it's it's really and high, so, yeah. yeah. Don't come with the... And then, and then going to Patagonia <laughs> to make to do some to, to do some snowboards with the kids. I was going to say, isn't it... It's super cold, though, right? Isn't it cold? Yeah, How it's... Cold, uh, we, we call in South America, this is the end of the world. They have the train <laughs> to the, the end of the world. Yeah. So we, we are going to trip pretty much because, you know, <laughs> my kids like the Frozen movie, so they want to see the snow. I, I, I ask them, hey, you need want to go to the Disneyland? Yeah. You want to go to see snow? They say, all the way, snow. Wow. Okay. So we're going to, to do some snowboard together and, you know, relax a little bit. You know, uh, I, I really need and deserve a vacation, so sure. I take some time for me. You know, <laughs> exactly. So, Lance, for you, uh, you know, have a great trip to Greece and Israel, and you know, Thanks safe flight back home. Yeah, and appreciate we'll it. Appreciate it. Looking forward to seeing you guys. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, yeah, enjoy your weekend. Thanks. It's time to go back, come back to Brazil, then. I can't wait, man. It was the best. <laughs> I love my time there, and hanging out with you guys, and just the whole country is amazing. So, thank you. Thank you, Thank you Len. Thank you so much, brother. Okay.